Okay. Well, good morning. Thanks. Uh, thanks for coming to 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 another of the Georgetown Americas Institute presentation, uh, following up on, on the session we had a week ago on Argentina's economy. Today, I mean, we we, we are fortunate to, to have a Rodrigo Sarasaga, who's a fellow of the Georgetown Americas uh, Institute. He's also uh, known to the university. He, he has visited Georgetown uh, several times. And he's an expert on Argentinian politics, society, etc. Rodrigo uh, is the lead researcher and director of the Institu Instituto Universitario Centro de Investigación y Acción Social, CIAS. He's a Jesuit priest and holds a PhD in political science from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he has a postdoctoral certificate from the University of Notre Dame, as well as a Bachelor of Philosophy and theology at the University of Buenos Aires. He's an adjunct, adjunct researcher at the National Council for Science Research, Research Techniques in Argentina, CONICET, the equivalent of the NSF here in the US. And his work focuses on the issues of redistribution, poverty, clientelism, and electoral politics. Um, he's the author of the book, The Poverty of a Rich Country, a, a compiler of several books on uh, politics in Argentina, and he has published widely in referee journals. So, so, I mean, let me just tell you that, I mean, I was in Buenos Aires like uh, four weeks ago and Rodrigo organized a dinner for me that was the most informative and insightful uh, place to try to understand. I wouldn't claim that I understood a lot, but I think it was a place in which I heard the best analysis, the best information, and uh, the best discussion of what Argentina is going through today. So with you, you have, I mean, one of the people that I would say have the best framework to analyze Argentinian politics and one of the best people in terms of uh, having the best information of what is going on in the country, not only uh, from what he, I mean, he hears from, from a lot of people, but also uh, because of the work he does in the province of Buenos Aires, that is kind of the epicenter of Argentinian politics. So with that, eh, Rodrigo, thank you very much for, for visiting Georgetown and thank you very much for agreeing to give us uh, this talk. We'll, Rodrigo will talk for about uh, 25 minutes and then we will open up to your questions. 
Thank you very much, Alejandro, uh, for your such a generous presentation. Uh, I hope that you do not expect that I am going to and explain Argentina to the crowd. If that's the expectation, I'm going to frustrate all of you. I have seen we have several Argentines and it is quite difficult to understand our country. So uh, it's a thanks to the Shorestone uh, Americas Institute for having me as a fellow. I was a uh, Father Matt Carnes, who is there, invited me, I think it was 2016 and I was a, an invited professor here and it's always a joy to be back to, to Georgetown. Uh, and sorry for my accent, I spent a lot of time in US, but there's something that Argentines cannot improve is the accent, whether in English or in Spanish, it's the same, you know. <laughs> I, I recall this task has nothing to do with the talk, but I was uh, doing my PhD at Berkeley and I say uh, said mass at the prison there at San Quentin in Spanish and a Mexican came to me and congratulated me, an inmate congratulated me because my Spanish and when I said, well, you know, I am from Argentina, uh, we speak Spanish. Well, in that case, it's not that good, he told me. You know? so, so apparently we are pretty bad at both languages. So. Uh, Let's uh, try to give some context to this national election that is happening in 10, 12 days from now. In 2001, uh, don't worry, I will be brief. It's, I will not go day by day since then. Uh, Argentina went probably through its worst uh, socioeconomic crisis of its history. I mean, it's social chaos and riots that left 30 people dead. The, President de la Rua resigned uh, only after roughly two years in power. In two weeks, we had four presidents. Uh, and after that, the Congress appointed the former governor of the province of Buenos Aires, the Peronist uh, Eduardo Dualde, to complete the de la Rua's uh, term. At that point, as you will remind me today, Dualde left the currency peg. At that point, one peso was, was one dollar. We tied our uh, currency to, to the dollar. So while they came out of that, and we went through a devaluation of six months of around 400%. So obviously that uh, produces more riots, protests in the street. And that point, the street proclaim was something like que se vayan todos, that will roughly translate and everyone should leave. And that was referred to the politicians. And from that point, the Argentine society uh, changed forever. Uh, a fragmented, a much more fragmented society emerged at that point, marked by unparalleled and previously unknown levels of poverty, unemployment, and informal labor, especially what it was previously an homogeneous labor class got completely fragmented. Since then, up to these days, two coalitions that emerged from that, uh, from that crisis have been governed. One is the Peronist poll expressed in after the crisis in Kirchnerism, and the non-Peronist or even anti-Peronist poll expressed in Cambiemos, that is led by, uh, mainly by a party pro, that is led by Macri, who I think it was a couple of days ago here. Okay, uh, but it was here too, not the uh, short South American. Yeah. Okay, so these two polls have been governing with more years. Uh, Cambiemos only governed four years from 2015 to 2019 uh, and the rest of the years by the Kirchners and now by Alberto Fernandez. And there was, after that crisis, a clear socioeconomic uh, cleavage in the vote. You can explain, uh, I don't know if we can put the first. So this is the election of 2015. And you can see yellow is the color of Cambiemos. And those are the districts where Cambiemos won in Argentina in 2015. And they are mainly the productive areas. Those that you are seeing in yellow is where Cambiemos won, but it's also 
uh, our pampas, the, the most productive, uh, as you probably know, areas in Argentina, uh, where you see blue is the color for uh, Frente para la Victoria, that will be the Peronist uh, coalition after 2003. And you will see the North province that are uh, the poor, the poorer parts where they got most of, of the votes. Uh, so, and you see the, the relatively wealthy capital city, it's always a, a can be able. Actually, this looks, uh, I don't know if you are soccer fans, but it looks a little bit like the second team's uh, jersey, Boca Juniors. And, and I said the second team, so that can guess which is my team. Uh, and that's the colors, you know, it's blue, yellow, and blue. And that center part is the wealthy part of the country. So you can explain uh, if we go to the next one. Sorry, Alejandro. Um, you can explain both uh, more recent uh, presidential elections in terms of that socioeconomic cleavage. Uh, in 2015, um, Peronists went divided. Uh, it was the end of the cycle of the Kirchner's and uh, can be most wrong. 2019, uh, Peronists uh, reunited. Uh, Cristina runs. Cristina Kirchner ran as vice president of Alberto Fernandez, and they won. But you can see that the areas that, that socioeconomic cleavage remain basically the same. That world that emerged a more fragmented well, with the polarized society between these two coalitions, it's apparently what have came to an end in the last primaries election in August, because it's a completely different map to the one that we are seeing now. Uh, and there's two fundamental aspects in this change that I want to bring up. First, uh, after that polarized scenario, um, after the relatively economic failures of these last two governments in providing a stable macroeconomics environment, uh, the results reflect a clear fragmentation. So we are facing fragmentation after polarization. Uh, and the social fragmentation that I said started at 2001 peak to reflect now uh, an electoral fragmentation. And we, Alejandro, I have to bother you again. There's not a remote there, so that I don't want to. <laughs> so you can see, uh, if you compare the previous map with the result of these primaries, between the first, the, for the front runner and the third, you only have two points, a little bit more than two points. Uh, and this, we say, okay, well, th those are the results of primaries. Well, our primaries are very particular because uh, they are actually unique to Argentina because they are compulsory. Everybody has to vote in primaries and you can vote in every, uh, in whatever party, whichever party you want, but you can only cast a single vote. So, uh, and as you can see, uh, the front runner, Milei, wasn't facing a, a challenger. Uh, he didn't have intra-party competition as the other two. Um, so, first characteristic of this new electoral scenario is clearly fragmentation after polarization. And second, and second, and probably what you have heard the most, sometimes people are ignoring this first aspect and it's uh, quite important. Look, it's almost perfect three thirds. No? Uh, it's that the front runner is a melee, an outsider, uh, quite an uh, eccentric outsider, I would say. Uh, that emerged as the most uh, voted candidate and the front runner for the general election. So we have a free round system. And as primary is compulsory, it's more like a, the first round of the election than, than a primary. Then we go to the general election. If a non candidate goes above 45% or above 40 and a gap of 10 points with the second, we go to the round off to the balotage we call. Uh, so Millet, who presented himself as a libertarian and promised a, a series of reform uh, that are somehow hard to put together. They are somehow different reforms disconnected. Um, 
and in some way improbable to happen. For sure, not all of them, but even some of them are improbable to happen, uh, such as blowing up the central bank, uh, that I think is quite illegal, uh, dollarize the economy, that might be a challenge since we don't have a single dollar. Our reserves are in 10 billions negative now, to give an idea. So it's pretty hard to dollarize an economy when you don't have uh, dollars. If you do it, it will be a devaluation that nobody knows of how much. No? Uh, he proposed to change the federal system of redistribution of fiscal funds. For that, you need the support of all the governors. That's very unlikely to happen. He's also proposing to reform the health and uh, the education system and uh, to reform the labor law, who obviously unions will oppose that. So. Uh, He's having this kind of diverse, uh, extreme uh, measures. And in difference with the two previous coalition that has governed Argentina and won the last uh, two previous elections, Millet was born not out of the 2001 crisis, but he was born out of the failure of these two other polls. So he is responding to a new claim from the electorate while the other two coalitions emerge as the Peronist and the anti-Peronist versions after the 2001 crisis, and as a reply to that, that crisis, Millet is responding to the failure of those two coalitions. So he's catching the boat of those who feel disappointed by those uh, coalitions. So who is voting for Millet? Uh, surprisingly, for being a... I didn't put the title that far right uh, wing candidate will win, but uh, surprisingly, being far right, he's competing with the Peronists for the vote of the poor. Uh, we can see that. So that's a, a correlation. In that X, uh, you have the share of votes of Millet. And as you progress in the X uh, axis, uh, you get the more the most poor the poorest uh, districts so as you and you can see as the poorest the poorer the district becomes the share of votes for Millet increase so he's getting more votes uh, among the poor and this is uh, at 99% of confidence so it's really a very solid correlation uh, you can try a, a quadratic yeah, you can try a quadratic and it will fit too because he's getting the vote of the upper and the poor. And actually, if you compare with the vote of the other two coalitions, uh, look how different it looks to the line for Cambiemos, you know. As the poor, the district uh, turns, Cambiemos uh, loses votes. Uh, so you, you can consider that these are the two right coalition, the two right parties, they are having a different electorate, clearly. But look what happened when you compare to the Peronists. It looks quite similar. So th this is a, the new scenario where a far right party is competing for the poor, uh, for the vote of the poor. And then uh, also he has the vote of the youngsters, as you can see. This was done by a colleague, uh, Ernesto Calvo. Uh, you can see these two things. He gets more votes for from men than from women, and as young as the younger the people are, more vote for Millet. So there is a new cleavage that was not there before. Before I said there was only a socioeconomic cleavage. Now we have an age cleavage with the youngster voting massively for Millet, uh, even in the shanty towns in the outskirts of Buenos Aires, what we call the conurbano bonaerense. Uh, I found there. I, I did a survey like a month before the election, and I found in the shanty towns, people below 25, Millet was the favorite candidate. That was uh, completely shocking for me. Actually, I didn't kind of say this publicly because I thought it was a mistake of that I was doing something wrong, that it was not representative. It ended up, it, it was all right. Um, so, why Millet? Why, why the poor? Why the youngster are voting for Millet? So with the exception of the period of economic growth with the Kirchners that went from 2003 roughly to 2008, 
the two coalitions that polarize fail to provide a economic growth and possibilities to the to the voters. The progressive side, that is the, the incumbent now, uh, speaks of a state that is present, present especially to the poor, and has a long list of rights that people then don't see verified in their everyday life. And we have just done a survey in shantytowns and mar uh, parents' most important concern is that their children do not learn to read in elementary school. Uh, the youngsters, most important concern that the only way to make a life, a decent life, is to get involved in drug dealing. So we have the progressive side saying, you have all these uh, rights, you have a state present uh, and a strong state, and people do not completely verify uh, that in their, in their daily life. The alternative to this was Cambiemos, and Cambiemos uh, ended the, the four years in, uh, of, of their term also in the middle of a crisis and taking all the measures that they have previously criticized and also with very high inflation. Now, inflation is around 200%, so 25% looks like nothing, but 25% a year, we will agree is a lot. So both polls seems to have failed in providing what people were expecting. As a consequence, Peronis does not have any more the monopoly over the votes of the poor, and Cambiemos does not have any, any more the monopoly over the votes of the upper classes. This other uh, candidate, Millet, emerged capturing votes from them. In fact, 25% of the people who voted uh, for Cambiemos in 2019 now voted for Millet. And 20, also 25% of the people who voted for Alberto Fernandez, the president nowadays, voted now uh, for, for Millet. So both coalitions are losing voters uh, to Millet. 53, 54% of the people that voted the Peronist or Cambiemos in the last election has left these coalitions. They either did not vote or voted for, for Millet. So someone, we are going from that proclaiming the street, everyone should live, to we are living. We are living the politics. We are living the coalitions we have had until here, and we are going with the outsider or we do not vote anymore. Those are the, the two options. So in that sense, the new cleavage is not a socioeconomic cleavage, and the new polarization is not a polarization between Peronists and anti-Peronists, but between politics and anti-politics. And Millet is capturing the, the vote of those who are supporting anti-politics. Voters abandon the true traditional, the two traditional coalitions and flock to support an outsider. So who are mainly flocking to, to support Millet? Well, those people, I think, who felt a long distance between their expectations and their harsh reality. Because those are the people that tend to support an outsider. Where as the longest is the distance between uh, my reality and what politicians are telling me, uh, more I am inclined to support an outsider, even if that might sound like a fantasy. So as my reality gets harsher, uh, more chances are that I will support uh, the fantasy of an outsider, even when it's very not very likely to happen. Uh, out of their disenchantment, voters opted for a radical option, regardless of how unlikely it was to succeed. In this, in this sense, the youngsters who are voting Miller, they never experience a period of economic growth. They don't have any recollection of a positive economic period. So that explains, they say, okay, let's try something different. And in that same Miller has been very effective and very clever. Uh, he doesn't seem to care about, as I was saying, the coherence of his project or the coalition that could possibly support that measures. But those fragmented measures match the, the fragmented electorate. So it seems uh, 
a fragmented fragmented electorate is picking up elements of those uh, Millet's promises. And in some way, his speech is a speech that fit that political fragmentation because it's a very simple speech where he's saying, okay, they, they are telling you you have these rights and you are not experiencing. They are telling you you will progress and you are not uh, progressing. And all this, it is because politics is imposing a burden, a cost over you. And he uses a level that calls the caste. The political caste is the one that does not let you to progress. What I will do, just remove that caste. And you, as an individual, will flourish. You will have a splendid life. Because if it has not happened so far, it is because the cost of politics. Let's remove the caste and you will be fine. Um, that speech where the individual liberated from the cost of, pol of politics will flourish seems to have been very effective. It seems Millet has found a simple and effective formula to run to his campaign. He does not seem to care that much about the coherence of his program or uh, the coalition that then can support uh, that program. So what to expect? It's most likely uh, Millet will win, probably. It will probably go to the ballotage with Massa, most likely. Uh, the change proposed by Burrich, the Cambiemos candidate, it does not seem to have enough traction. Like people are asking for a total change. And when you start to propose a more moderate uh, change, that does not have traction in the society, a society that feels deeply frustrated. Um, so it will be a scenario of for the new president, uh, and it will be a challenge for, for whoever wins, governability is going to be a challenge because it's a fragmented society where there will not be many channels to those fragments. Parties and from defeat, the two previous coalitions will be weaker. And links as unions or social movements only connect to small portions of those fragments. So uh, it will be a more fragmented society with uh, weaker links to those fragments. So whoever wins is going to have a challenge in that fragmentation. If on top of that, uh, you add that individuals are, expect, are frustrated and expecting a soon economic recovery, well, the combination can be hard for any uh, candidate who wins. Uh, and paradoxically, uh, a fragmented society can come together to protest. We have learned that with different motives, but they will protest. Uh, so the new government will have I think big challenges in Argentina, and especially if it's Millet, who is, as I think, the most likely to win the election, uh, he will not have a single governor. He will not have a single mayor. Uh, he will have around 10 to 15% of Congress, both houses, no more than that, probably. And he's proposing two extreme reforms and politics for the coalition that is supporting him. Uh, he has now and then one union leader, but obviously he does not support. He does not have the support of unions. He does not have the support of social movements. Even in the business uh, group, there is not a clear support for Millet. So it will be a challenge, and there's a lot of uncertainty. What he will do once he get there, he kind of completely change his agenda and go somewhere else, or he will face real challenge to, to governability. Uh, so we are facing a very challenging economic scenario with social fragmentation. The positive note, which we, I would like to end, is saying that we, since for democratization in 1983, we have, went, uh, we have gone already through several huge economic, socioeconomic crisis, like 2001, the one I started talking about, and also 1989. And through all those crises, uh, democracy was never at stake. And 
in that sense, I trust in the Argentine society, Argentine civil society, that whichever is the result of the election, democracy will not be at stake. Thanks. So you can see there how the map changed in the last three elections where purple is a village color. So look how different it looks now. No? So, so, I mean, before we, we, we take questions from, from the audience, uh, I mean, you describe parts of, of Millet's economic program and, and, and you also discuss kind of a Patricia Bullrich economic uh, program saying that it's, similar to Millet, but not as bold as Millet. On the other hand, we saw the, 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 the charts on, on who the voters or the Millet voters are. And I mean, in this very simplistic interpretation that I will do is you, you told us, look, Millet vo voter base is general across the spectrum, but it's much closer to the Peronis than to Cambiemos. So with whom, if Millet gets to power, with he chooses to govern with a, a coalition with somebody that is closest to him in his agenda, or he chooses to go with the Peronis where his support base gravitates closer to the Peronis, or he goes alone, a, a, trying to do it by, by, by himself. Uh, at once, I think uh, in one interview, he kind of said that he was willing to jam it into referendums if, I mean, Congress blocks his initiatives. No? So, so what do you think is going to be his political strategy to advance his agenda? I don't have a clue. <laughs> Honestly, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about this. Uh, we know that this, uh, He's proposing two extreme and radical reform, and that he does not have today the coalition to support any of that. Uh, there has been signs from parts of Cambiemos. Uh, actually, yesterday, Macri said that they, they will, he would like that his party will support, support those reforms that are okay. So. He's somehow signaling that he will give some support, at least to some of the measures of Millet, and that I'm not sure. Uh, Millet has constructed a, a character from not compromising. So it will be a radical change now if once in government he starts to make all this compromise. Uh, I imagine him trying to govern by himself, and but I don't know. I am skeptical about how successful that can be. Thanks. So let's say, yeah, Matt. That's about the way you put it in context. Oh. Yeah. Thank you for this. I especially appreciate the way you put things in context going all the way back to 2001. I was wondering if you could put it in the context of your own earlier work. Okay, so what you've written on a lot before is the network of brokers that the Peronists were so able to use to dole out benefits and then ensure that they get elected. And then you have a book in manuscript, I know, that's actually looking at how other, in Cambiemos among them, found ways to start to create their own networks of brokers and try to you know, distribute. What seems to be happening with Malay is it, there's no network there, right? There's no distribution network. There's no sort of close alliances. So how does this fit with that earlier analysis and, and what does it mean for the future of Argentine politics? I guess one interpretation would be actually, maybe it severs that vote buying that was so present before and sort of this machine politics that existed before. Is that good for democracy, bad for democracy? I don't know. So I'd be curious for you to put it in the context of your own earlier work. I was fearing that question and it came from a Jesuit fellow. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> um, what I, uh, I actually, from one perspective, I say, well, it seems the machine days are over. Well, like the boat by machine is over. But no, uh, I have been studying what we call cat pilots. So in Argentina, you actually boat with a paper pilot that have different segments for president, congressman, and mayor. And usually uh, people vote with a single 
vote for a party and pick up that party. Uh, and people will cut the mayor for a different from a different party to that of the president. And I would say spontaneously around three, maximum 5%. The networks are alive, but they are alive for the local level. So this uh, local ne these networks are personal local networks that depend on basically on the mayors. Maybe they go up to the governors, but and they are using that networks to cut ballots. And so what it will the broker, the political broker in the shanty tag will go to you and say, Who are you voting? Millet, because I am okay. Here you have vote Millet with my mayor, and he will cut the, the ballot for you. That's where we are seeing that the network is still alive. An interesting question for the election coming in for the general election. I have seen a lot of Cambiemos mayor and Peronist mayor that they were not cutting their ballots with those of Millet because they were not expecting Millet to have such amount of votes. Now they have discovered that and they are cutting, they are putting their ballot as mayors with Millet for president. And that can increase the share of votes of Millet to the point that getting him above 40%. Hi, thank you so much. So my question is, why and how, in your opinion, is Massa getting that second place and second ticket to the ballotage now? Where is he getting these new votes from? Of course, he's keeping some of the Grabois' votes because, you know, and, and that 5% is a lot in this context, but considering the economic situation of Argentina, you know, a second place for Massa deserves some explanation. Uh, is he getting votes from La Reta? Is he getting votes from those candidates who didn't get more than 1.5%? Is Cambemos losing voters to Millet? Why is Massa getting that second place? I think there are two, two things here. One, it's very hard to think of a Peronist candidate that does not have a floor of 30%, you know, like very high. I, I don't imagine that. So 30% will be there most likely, uh, even from the structure you know, from the people you can move in an election. And then the other thing that I think is adding to that, uh, so 30% will likely put you in, in, in the in the ballotage. You know? So that might be. But then what is happening is that uh, Coming out of the primaries, uh, Bullrich does not find a, a place where she's comfortable. And Millet has been very clever on that and has called her like a second brand. You know, you want to change? I am the main brand. She's a second brand. And so I think the total change, the radical change that Millet is proposing gets more traction than this moderate change. So. I think uh, more than Massa winning is that Cambiemos is not winning votes to get to the other round. So I think those, those two factors, we don't know, no? maybe since God, I'm not going to be here in 10 days after the elections, <laughs> but I, yeah, I don't see at this moment, Bullrich will need to change her, her campaign to be able to get to the, to the, to the second round. Um, recently, we've seen in the past few years a large shift towards leftist politics, back towards leftist politics in the rest of Latin America. Is Argentina in this case an outlier, an outlier in a unique circumstance, or could this be reflective of a larger shift towards right-wing politics throughout all of Latin America? Well, it, it depends where you look. No, uh, you have Bukele in El Salvador, Paraguay, so. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not expecting a, a wave in that sense. I, I think societies are, as Argentina, becoming more fragmented uh, with political leadership becoming more challenging because it's harder to conduct a fragmented society. I think we can expect 
governance from every side. You know? That will be my my hunch. I will not expect a, a wave as a, we, we had before. You're right, we had clearly waves. Uh, I think it can be, governance can be also fragmented. You know? Who knows who is, what is going to happen in Peru? What will happen in Colombia after Petrus? I, I, yeah, I, I, I imagine the more diversity actually. Yeah. So after that question, I think we should move to the right. And take as Argentina. <laughs> yeah. So bo both of you, whoever wants to go first. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, we see from your presentation that he is pulling votes from Cambiemos and the Peronist coalition, but it seems like he's pulling more votes in the lower class. So why might the upper class might not be as infatuated with him? Actually, I think uh, you were pointing to me. You have you can fit there where I fit a line. You can fit a U a quadratic relationship, so a U shape, where you have the upper class supporting him and the poor supporting Millet, and where he does not get much traction are in middle classes, um, upper middle classes. Uh, why I do not have any scientific uh, explanation, I will think is more educated people and more concerned with the coherence of his program. That will be my, my intuition. Hi, um, thank you for being here. Um, thinking about the debate this weekend, uh, there's a division in between Millet supporters that some say that it's good that he was more tamed and that he might perhaps actually listen to people once he governs when thinking about like the more radical components of his agenda. Um, but then the other people said that he's not being genuine, that he was not that melee that was ferocious and like loud and like really that type of like um, just push towards a more radical agenda that he claims that Argentina needs. So thinking about that and like the way that he acted, like how do you think he would govern when it would come to like really difficult decisions and will he listen? I found the debate rather poor. And I don't think that that debate will change much of the preference of the voters. And in that sense, I think it benefits Millet because he's he's leading. And so when you are leading, you don't want change. You know? So I, I would tend to agree with the first group on, on your question. Uh, on the second question, uh, again, I think it was uh, also Alejandro's question. I don't have an answer. You know? uh, if he tries to put a coalition by making concessions, then he will be uh, frustrating his electorate, you know, because he has promised a radical change, that he will get the country rid of the caste. Uh, so I, I don't see that as a very likely option. Uh, it will mean that he will have to change all of his promises, his own style of leadership. Uh, and at the same time, uh, by himself, as I was showing, he doesn't have governors, he doesn't have representative senators. Uh, I don't see that by himself he can accomplish much. So, yeah, I think there's great uncertainty about that question. Hi, thank you so much. Uh I know it's a little bit hard to predict the future, especially when we're talking about Argentina, but if Millet is elected, um, how do you see the breakdown of the two of the two main coalitions within the factions of, of those? So, you know, the more moderate groups of, of Cambiemos, as well as the Kirchnerist faction in, in, in the Peronists. Uh, the, I really think that they will be much weaker and that they will split. Uh, you can see already that in Cambiemos with the radical party who is part of the coalition, like doing their own things and uh, more dispersed. So I will think th that if Millet wins, the defeat will divide and weak both. Uh, and probably we will see a, a, a realignment of groups and parties. Again, I think with a lot of political fragmentation, and that could be a problem because in 2001, when the La Rua government collapsed, 
Uh, the Peronists had a network of governors, and that's why uh, Dualde ended up being the, the president. Uh, he could handle that network and he could pacify the poor, great Buenos Aires. If Millet wins and these two coalitions uh, will be much weaker and fragmented, and in the, if then Millet does not, uh, is not able to have some governability, I don't see much of a bench uh, in that scenario. So it's something that worries me. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I actually have a question about uh, Argentina uh, on the global stage. Um, if Malay indeed does win the election, how do you see the relationship uh, with the United States uh, and Argentina changing, if at all? Um, and how do you see Argentina um, taking on a different role um, internationally? Uh, I know recently uh, Argentina has been very interested in joining like the BRICS organization, for example. Um, do you see any radical changes <clears throat> there as well? Thank you. My hope is that we will win again the Soccer World Cup. That's my first hope when it comes to international affairs. Uh, second to that, I imagine Millet uh, being more friendly and closer to US and to Israel. He has announced that he will be uh, close to, to these two countries. Uh, so, but then again, you know, if, if you don't have, uh, let's see if he has enough governability because if he's not able to I don't think that he could do much in the in the international re relations if, if he cannot govern the country you know? so uh, yeah that that will be a second challenge I think but yeah I think you can expect him at least trying to be more open and closer to US and Israel uh, the one who is going to be we, we I, our consigliere a little bit, uh, the Secretary of State for International Relationships, is a woman that uh, I think uh, she's closer also to to US and to make a, an agreement with the IMF. So probably a better relationship in that sense. Yeah. Uh, Father, um, to what extent your fair assessment of the situation that we all agree that this is what's happening, it's inevitable. Um, in face of what Macri said yesterday in Harvard, offering his help, and this enraged uh, Patricia Bullrich because we are competing against, uh, um, and also based on the debate, I don't know what will happen this Sunday, but I don't expect big changes because of the format of the debate will not allow big changes. My conclusion as an observer, when they finish talking, other than Miriam Bregman, all the others offer more or less the same. And they, whoever wins, they know what they have to do to stabilize the economy and to forge governability because this is our challenge, governability now. If it takes like men and took a year and something more than a year to stabilize the economy, but at least he kept the system working uh, when, when he started, um, that's fine. We could go through crisis, but keep democracy working. To keep democracy working, you need to have governability and coalitions. So my question is, coming again, this, this, is this inevitable? No, I don't think things are inevitable, yeah. but it seems, I think more likely uh, Millet will win. I think there's an agreement, we need to reduce the fiscal deficit, but to do that, uh, you need to cut fingers, you know, to, when you are reducing the fiscal deficit, you have to negotiate with groups and uh, impose costs in different groups. And that's where I have more doubts about uh, Millet because he doesn't seem to have the links to those groups to, to make those negotiations. Everybody agrees we need to reduce the deficit, but then all think that the other has to reduce the deficit. No. 
business. People think the unions have to reduce the cost of uh, health insurance. Uh, the union think uh, the business has to cut profit. And so finally, to put a coalition able to reduce the deficit, you need a strong political leadership able to negotiate with those who are paying the costs at, uh, at the end of the day. And I don't see that there so far. Any other question? Okay, so so if not, let me. Uh, uh, I mean, and 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 words. In in addition to to the, these intermediaries, I mean, unions, uh, uh, the people that work kind of picking votes, etc. But where do you think Argentinian society is today, regarding the level of uh, acceptance of a major? transformational agenda that generates uh, I mean, significant costs for society, especially in the first couple of years. Do you think it's ready? Do you think it's, it's going to be very hard to sustain this for, 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 for the first two years of an administration? As I was trying to transmit, I see a very fragmented society and with groups more convinced that other has to pay the cost so i don't see le, i don't see an agreement of where uh, you have to impose the cost and uh, the capacity right now to bear them so i am rather skeptical so far thanks so so maybe with with that i think we will close you uh, you spoke about predictability and forecast for the argent for it any economy and for Argentina in particular or society. And I think a lot of people say, you know, that uh, you go back to Buenos Aires after one week and everything is different, but you go back to Buenos Aires or to Argentina after 10 years and everything is the same. So hopefully that will not be the case uh, this time, but it seems from what you're saying that, I mean, the election seems to be different, et cetera, but after the election, it might be very hard for, for Argentina to, to get its act together and, and really come out of this with a, 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 a more both economically and social stable and inclusive and, and dynamic country. So th thank you very much for, for spending a couple of weeks with us. And, and well, we, we, we will be calling you uh, to understand what, what will be going on in Argentina, not only in the elections, but obviously at the start of the new world. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Thanks all for being here. Thanks.